Hi, I'm Jessica, the branch director at the Trone Memorial Library, and this is chapter 30 of The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. That evening, when Archer came down before dinner, he found the drawing room empty. He and May were dining alone, all the family engagements having been postponed since Mrs. Manson Mingott's illness. And as May was the more punctual of the two, he was surprised that she had not preceded him. He knew that she was at home, for while he dressed, he had heard her moving about in her room, and he wondered what had delayed her. He had fallen into the way of dwelling on such conjectures as a means of tying his thoughts fast to reality. Sometimes he felt as if he had found the clue to his father-in-law's absorption and trifles. Perhaps even Mr. Welland, long ago, had had escapes and visions and had conjured up all the hosts of domesticity to defend himself against them. When May appeared, he thought she looked tired. She had put on the low-necked and tightly laced dinner dress, which the Mingott ceremonial exacted on the most informal occasions, and had built her fair hair into its usual accumulated coils. And her face, in contrast, was wan and almost faded. But she shone on him with her usual tenderness, and her eyes had kept the blue dazzle of the day before. "'What became of you, dear?' she asked. I was waiting at Granny's, and Ellen came alone and said she had dropped you on the way because you had to rush off on business. There's nothing wrong? Only some letters I'd forgotten and wanted to get off before dinner. Ah, she said. And a moment afterward, I'm sorry you didn't come to Granny's unless the letters were urgent. They were, he rejoined, surprised at her insistence. Besides, I don't see why I should have gone to your grandmother's. I didn't know you were there. She turned and moved to the looking glass above the mantelpiece. As she stood there, lifting her long arm to fasten a puff that had slipped from its place in her intricate hair, Archer was struck by something languid and inelastic in her attitude and wondered if the deadly monotony of their lives had laid its weight on her also. Then he remembered that as he had left the house that morning, she had called over the stairs that she would meet him at her grandmother so that they might drive home together. He had called back a cheery yes and then, absorbed in other visions, had forgotten his promise. Now he was smitten with compunction, yet irritated that so trifling an omission should be stored up against him after nearly two years of marriage. He was weary of living in a perpetual tepid honeymoon, without the temperature of passion, yet with all its exactions. If May had spoken out her grievances, he suspected her of many, he might have laughed them away, but she was trained to conceal imaginary wounds under a Spartan smile. To disguise his own annoyance, he asked her how her grandmother was, and she answered that Mrs. Mingott was still improving, but had been rather disturbed by the last news about the Beauforts. What news? It seems they're going to stay in New York. I believe he's going into an insurance business or something. They're looking about for a small house. The preposterousness of the case was beyond discussion, and they went in to dinner. During dinner, their talk moved in its usual limited circle, but Archer noticed that his wife made no allusion to Madame Olenska, nor to old Catherine's reception of her. He was thankful for the fact, yet felt it to be vaguely ominous. They went up to the library for coffee, and Archer lit a cigar and took down a volume of Michelet. He had taken to history in the evening since May had shown a tendency to ask him to read aloud whenever she saw him with a volume of poetry. Not that he disliked the sound of his own voice, but because he could always foresee her comments on what he read. In the days of their engagement, she had simply, as he now perceived, echoed what he told her. But since he had ceased to provide her with opinions, she had begun to hazard her own with results destructive to his enjoyment of the works commented on. Seeing that he had chosen history, she fetched her work basket, drew up an armchair to the green shaded student lamp and uncovered a cushion she was embroidering for his sofa. She was not a clever needlewoman. Her large capable hands were made for riding, rowing and open air activities. But since other wives embroidered cushions for their husbands, she did not wish to omit this last link in her devotion. She was so placed that Archer, by nearly raising his eyes, could see her bent above her work frame, her ruffled elbow sleeves slipping back from her firm round arms, the betrothal sapphire shining on her left hand above her broad gold wedding ring, and the right hand slowly and laboriously stabbing the canvas. 
As she sat thus, the lamplight full on her clear brow, he said to himself with a secret dismay that he would always know the thoughts behind it, that never in all the years to come would she surprise him by an unexpected mood, by a new idea, a weakness, a cruelty, or an emotion. She had spent her poetry and romance on their short courting. The function was exhausted because the need was past. Now she was simply ripening into a copy of her mother and mysteriously, by the very process, trying to turn him into a Mr. Welland. He laid down his book and stood up impatiently and at once she raised her head. What's the matter? The room is stifling, I want some air. He had insisted that the library curtains should draw backward and forward on a rod so that they might be closed in the evening instead of remaining nailed to a gilt cornice and immovably looped up over layers of lace as in the drawing room and he pulled them back and pushed up the sash leaning out into the icy night. The mere fact of not looking at May seated beside his table under his lamp, the fact of seeing other houses, roofs, chimneys, of getting the sense of other lives outside his own, other cities beyond New York, and a whole world beyond his world, cleared his brain and made it easier to breathe. After he had leaned out into the darkness for a few minutes, he heard her say, Newland, do shut the window, you'll catch your death. He pulled the sash down and turned back. Catch my death, he echoed, and he felt like adding, but if I've caught it already, I am dead. I've been dead for months and months. And suddenly the play of the word flashed up a wild suggestion. What if it were she who was dead? If she were going to die, to die soon and leave him free. The sensation of standing there in that warm, familiar room and looking at her and wishing her dead was so strange, so fascinating and overmastering that its enormity did not immediately strike him. He simply felt that chance had given him a new possibility to which his sick soul might cling. Yes, May might die. People did. Young people, healthy people like herself. She might die and set him suddenly free. She glanced up and he saw by her widening eyes that there must be something strange in his own. Newland, are you ill? He shook his head and turned toward his armchair. She bent over her work frame and as he passed, he laid his hand on her hair. Poor May, he said. Poor, why poor? She echoed with a strained laugh. Because I shall never be able to open a window without worrying you, he rejoined, laughing also. For a moment, she was silent. Then she said very low, her head bowed over her work, I shall never worry if you're happy. Oh, my dear, and I shall never be happy unless I can open the windows. In this weather? She remonstrated, and with a sigh, he buried his head in his book. Six or seven days passed. Archer heard nothing from Madame Olenska and became aware that her name would not be mentioned in his presence by any member of the family. He did not try to see her. To do so while she was at old Catherine's guarded bedside would have been almost impossible. In the uncertainty of the situation, he let himself drift, conscious, somewhere below the surface of his thoughts, of a resolve which had come to him when he had leaned out from his library window into the icy night. The strength of that resolve made it easy to wait and make no sign. Then one day, May told him that Mrs. Manson Mangott had asked to see him. There was nothing surprising in the request, for the old lady was steadily recovering, and she had always openly declared that she preferred Archer to any of her other grandsons-in-law. May gave the message with evident pleasure. She was proud of old Catherine's appreciation of her husband. There was a moment's pause, and then Archer felt it incumbent on him to say, All right, shall we go together this afternoon? His wife's face brightened, but she instantly answered, Oh, you'd much better go alone. It bores Granny to see the same people too often. Archer's heart was beating violently when he rang old Mrs. Mingott's bell. He had wanted above all things to go alone, for he felt sure the visit would give him the chance of saying a word in private to the Countess Olenska. He had determined to wait till the chance presented itself naturally, and here it was, and here he was on the doorstep. Behind the door, behind the curtains of the yellow damask room next to the hall, she was surely awaiting him. In another moment, he would see her and be able to speak to her before she led him to the sick room. He wanted only to put one question. After that, his course would be clear. What if he wished to ask was simply the date of her return to Washington? And that question she could hardly refuse to answer. But in the yellow sitting room, it was the mulatto maid who waited. 
her white teeth shining like a keyboard, she passed back the sliding doors and ushered him into old Catherine's presence. The old woman sat in a vast throne-like armchair near her bed. Beside her was a mahogany stand bearing a cast bronze lamp with an engraved globe over which a green paper shade had been balanced. There was not a book or a newspaper in reach, nor any evidence of feminine employment. Conversation had always been Mrs. Mingott's sole pursuit, and she would have scorned to feign an interest in fancy work. Archer saw no trace of the slight distortion left by her stroke. She merely looked paler, with darker shadows in the folds and recesses of her obesity, and in the fluted mob cap tied by a starched bow between her first two chins, and the muslin kerchief crossed over her billowing purple dressing gown. She seemed like some shrewd and kindly ancestress of her own who might have yielded too free, freely to the pleasures of the table. She held out one of the little hands that nestled in a hollow of her huge lap like pet animals and called to the maid, don't let in anyone else. If my daughter's call, say I'm asleep. The maid disappeared and the old lady turned to her grandson. My dear, am I perfectly hideous? She asked gaily, launching out one hand in search of the folds of muslin on her inaccessible bosom. My daughters tell me it doesn't matter at my age, as if hideousness didn't matter all the more the harder it gets to conceal. My dear, you're handsomer than ever. Archer rejoined in the same tone, and she threw back her head and laughed. <laughs> but not as handsome as Ellen, she jerked out, twinkling at him maliciously. And before he could answer, she added, Was she so awfully handsome the day you drove her up from the ferry? He laughed, and she continued, Was it because you told her that she had to put you out on the way? In my youth, young men didn't desert pretty women unless they were made to. She gave another chuckle and interrupted it to say almost aquariously, It's a pity she didn't marry you. I always told her so. It would have spared me all this worry. But who ever thought of sparing their grandmother worry? Archer wondered if her illness had blurred her faculties, but suddenly she broke out. Well, it's settled anyhow. She's going to stay with me, whatever the rest of the family say. She hadn't been here five minutes before I'd have gone down on my knees to keep her, if only for the last twenty years I'd been able to see where the floor was. Archer listened in silence, and she went on. They talked me over, as no doubt you know, persuaded me, Lovell and Letter Blair and Augusta Welland and all the rest of them, that I must hold out and cut off her allowance till she was made to see that it was her duty to go back to Olinsky. They thought they'd convince me when the secretary, or whatever he was, came out with the last proposals, handsome proposals I confess they were. After all, marriage is marriage and money's money, both useful things in their way, and I didn't know what to answer. She broke off and drew a long breath, as if speaking had become an effort. But a minute I laid eyes on her, I said, you sweet bird, you shut you up in that cage again, never. And now it's settled that she's to stay here and nurse her granny as long as there's a granny to nurse. It's not a gay prospect, but she doesn't mind. And of course, I've told Letter Blair that she's to be given her proper allowance. The young man heard her with veins aglow, but in his confusion of mind, he hardly knew whether her news brought joy or pain. He had so definitely decided on the course he meant to pursue that for the moment he could not readjust his thoughts, but gradually there stole over him the delicious sense of difficulties deferred and opportunities miraculously provided. If Ellen had consented to come and live with her grandmother, it must surely be because she had recognized the impossibility of giving him up. This was her answer to his final appeal of the other day. If she would not take the extreme step he had urged, she had at last yielded to half measures. He sank back into the thought with the involuntary relief of a man who has been ready to risk everything and suddenly taste the dangerous sweetness of security. She couldn't have gone back. It was impossible, he exclaimed. Ah, oh, my dear, I always knew you were on her side. And that's why I sent for you today and why I said to your pretty wife when she proposed to come with you, no, my dear, I'm pining to see Newland and I don't want anybody to share our transports. For you see, my dear, she drew her head back as far as the, its tethering chins permitted and looked him full in the eyes. You see, you sh we shall have a fight yet. The family don't want her here and they'll say it's because I've been ill because I'm a weak old woman that she's persuaded me, but I'm not well enough yet to fight them one by one and you've got to do it for me. I, he stammered, you, why not? 
She jerked back at him, her round eyes suddenly as sharp as pen knives. Her hand fluttered from its chair arm and lit on his with a clutch of little pale nails like bird claws. Why not? She certainly repeated. Archer, under the exposure of her gaze, had recovered his self-possession. Oh, I don't count. I'm too insignificant. Well, you're Letter Blair's partner, aren't ain't you? You've got to get at them through Letter Blair, unless you've got a reason, she insisted. Oh, my dear, I back you to hold your own against them all without my help, but you shall have it if you need it, he reassured her. Then we're safe, she sighed. And smiling on him with all her ancient cunning, she added, as she settled her head among the cushions, I always knew you'd back us up because you never quote when they talk about it's being her duty to go home. He winced a little at her terrifying perspicacity and longed to ask, and may, do they quote her? But he judged it safer to turn the question. And Madame Olenska, when am I to see her? He said. The old lady chuckled, crumpled her lids, and went through the pantomime of archness. <laughs> Not today. Only a time, please. One at a time, please. Madame Olenska's gone out. He flushed with disappointment, and she went on. She's gone out, my child. Gone in my carriage to see Regina Beaufort. She paused for this announcement to produce its effect. That's what she's reduced me to already. The day after she got here, she put on her best bonnet and told me as cool as a cucumber that she was going to call on Regina Beaufort. I don't know her. Who is she, says I. She's her grandniece and a most unhappy woman, she says. She's the wife of a scoundrel, I answered. Well, she says, and so am I, and yet all my family want me to go back to him. Well, that floored me, and I let her go, and finally one day she said it was raining too hard to go out on foot, and she wanted me to lend her my carriage. What for, I asked her, and she said to go and see Cousin Regina. Cousin! Now, my dear, I looked out the window and saw it wasn't raining a drop, but I understood her, and I let her have the carriage. After all, Regina's a brave woman, and so is she, and I've always liked courage above everything." Archer bent down and pressed his lips on the little hand that still lay on his. <laughs> Whose hand did you think you were kissing, young man? Your wife's, I hope? The old lady snapped out with her mocking cackle, and as he rose to go, she called out after him. <laughs> Give her her granny's love, but you'd better not say anything about our talk.